Shri Damadar Janani by Shivaram Swami Chapter 11 Nanamharaj Releases Krishna Ulukalam vikarshantam Damna bhadam swam atmajam Vilokya nanla prahasad Vadano vimu mochaha when Nandamara saw his own son bound with ropes of the wooden mortar and dragging it, he smiled and released Krishna from his bonds. Srimad Bhagavatam 10.11.6 With the two demigods gone, Krishna was now free to resume his role as a cowherd boy. Still finding the game of pulling the mortar a novelty, Krishna repeatedly drew it to him and then kicked it away, laughing as it rolled back as far as the rope would allow. Such fun was too good to enjoy alone, and Krishna longed for his friends. Standing up to better see over the fallen branches, he caught sight of them in the distance, looking intently at him with questioning eyes, but still immovable. Krishna singled with his right arm, calling them, Shridama, come and see what happened. Let us play here. The moment Krishna's words reached the gopas, they were free to move, and since they had been strained at their invisible bonds, some of them tumbled forward with the weight of their own momentum. Rising to their feet, the boys ran to the fallen trees, and not sure whether to cheer Krishna or to caution him. Felling these trees would no doubt meet with reprisal from Mother Yashoda and maybe even the more lenient Nanda Maharaj. The boys closed in on Krishna, and the way a small swarm of bees descends upon an open pot of honey. As they caught sight of Krishna's joyful face and victorious smile, they called out his name and made whooping sounds of mirth. Wading in amongst the branches, Sridhama embraced Krishna, while some other boys balanced on the trunks of the trees, saying, Look at me! Finally, they gathered around and embraced Krishna, caressing his limbs to see that no harm had befallen him. I am unharmed. You are safe now. We are here to protect you. But wait until your mother sees your latest antics. And you will think the mortar punishment was bad? She will tie you to these trees and make you stay here overnight. Wild dogs and all. The boys laughed at the prospect of Krishna being further confined to a large, immovable object. Krishna crossed his arms and pouted in defiance. I can pull mountains if I want. That just fueled the boys' laughter. Oh, that is rich. He is going to move a mountain. Krishna raised his voice. Not only will I move it, but I'll lift it. You wait and see. Some boys continued with their hilarity, and some other older gopas became concerned. Would Krishna, of mystical ways, try something rash and get them all in serious trouble? Sridhama spoke over the din. Very well. We will wait until that time that you lift a mountain, but tell us, who were those two beings that you were talking to? Krishna replied, They were spirits living in the trees. Where did they go? Krishna downplayed his role in toppling the trees. The boys could never hold a secret. They would make him the certain object of his mother's anger. The terms of their curse expired, and so they broke out of their tree forms and toppled them. Then they returned to their homes. The spirits did not topple the trees. You did. We saw you pull them down with the mortar, saw it with our own eyes, and then those beings came out and chatted with you. What did they say? This line of interrogation was not what Krishna had in mind. He wanted to play. Pushing the mortar with his foot, he changed the subject, saying, Watch this! And the mortar rolled away, and then rolled back again when he pulled on the rope. It is fun! Enticed by a new game, the boys crowded on. Let me try. But they could not budge the mortar. Only Krishna could. As Krishna and the boys were playing, 
the Rajmasis regain their senses one by one. The crack of the Arjuna trees still resounding in their ears, they stood to their feet, trying to clear their heads of the deafening sound. Indeed, that sound had not only deafened the villagers, but the four elephants controlling the directions of heaven. The Vrajvasis looked around to see what could have caused such a terrible vibration. Their immediate thought was to look to the sky. It may have been the rumbling of clouds, but the sky was clear. They wondered if it was perhaps some extraordinary lightning, like Indra's lightning bolt striking the earth. But without any clouds, it was unlikely. Unable to discern the cause of the disturbance, the Rajvasis became fearful and wondered whether some demons had entered their land. Standing together in close-knit groups for comfort, they looked here and there with restless eyes. Had the ghosts of Putana or Trinarvata returned to the village? While Goku village was in a state of confusion, some gopis visiting from nearby Rava came across Krishna and his friends playing among the fallen trees. Taking in the scene before them, they concluded that the falling trees had caused the thunderclap. Without asking the boys, and conjecturing that it was the work of a demon, they immediately rushed uphill to inform Mother Yashoda. Their faces pale in fear for Krishna's welfare, the lady spoke to Yashoda in a panic. O oh, queen, the two trees that are always fulfilled our desires have fallen on your son. Like a tied calf, Damodar is standing between the two trees, laughing. Come with us and rescue your son from the jaws of death. Vraja's queen had just risen from a swoon induced by the breaking trees. Hearing the words, the trees have fallen on Krishna. She was besides herself with anxiety and fainted once again. The other village ladies tried frantically to rouse her, but Yashoda could not be wakened. In her faint, Yashoda was already running towards Krishna to rescue him. Why would she respond to the calls in her ears? While some women were trying to revive Mother Yashoda, the cowherd men gathered around Nandamaraj. Having received the news of the fallen trees and seeing that the crowns of the Arjuna trees were no longer visible, the men proceeded downhill, followed by their wives. As Nandamaraj led his court to the Arjuna trees, other villagers cautiously came out of their homes, frantic with worry at the gossip that demons had again attacked Krishna. The Vrajvasis had been relishing the sweet bliss of the Diwali festival, greatly enhanced by the story of Yashoda binding Krishna. But that sweetness quickly transformed into bitterness with the news of a calamity befalling them. Abandoning their duties, they rushed towards the Yamuna. Even from a distance, the Rajvasis could see a gap where the Arjuna trees once stood. As they hurried towards that place, their footsteps and voices mixed into a rolling thunderclap of its own. The men put forward different speculations as to what might have been happened, fueling each other's anxiety of love. At the first sight of the fallen trees, the Rajvasis stopped. Still at a distance, the men spread out to examine the scene for themselves, their wives and daughters peeping warily over their shoulders. Indeed, the trees have fallen. Are there any demons about? None that we can see. There does not appear to be anyone around. Is that good or bad? In this way, the Rajvasi speculated, sometimes moving forward a few steps, sometimes stopping when the branch of the trees moved. The Gopas held a variety of makeshift weapons like sticks for herding cows, churning rods, and garden hose, while Nanamaraj's soldiers stood at ready with spears, swords, and bows. Between the tree branches were Krishna and the boys. When they saw the entire village headed their way, they knew that their games had come to an end, and Krishna would have to tend with the ramifications of his deforesting of Raja. One boy said, All of Vrindavan is coming our way. Oh, this is really serious. Krishna, you are really in trouble now. What do you mean I'm in trouble? I thought we are a team. Being tied to the mortar, Krishna had no place to run. The only hope was to hide, he whispered. 
get down and hide under the branches. Maybe they'll go elsewhere to look for us. The trees had generous crowns, and it being just after rainy season, those crowns were rich with foliage. Thus the small boys easily remained out of sight of the Rajvasis. The fear of reprimand combined with the excitement at their mischief caused the boys to giggle, laugh, and poke at each other. Shh! Be quiet! They'll hear you! Like nestling setting, in for the night the boys huddled together beneath the branches and leaves. Unlike birds, though, the boys felt an extreme ecstasy in being so near Krishna. Damodar was the condensed form of divine bliss. By pressing in on him, the boys felt such unprecedented joy that they became oblivious to their risky predicament and silently trembled and wept in joy. Some whispered, Are you cold? No. Are you afraid? No. I just feel, I feel happy. Yes. Me too. But Krishna silenced them. Be quiet and stay down. And they sat together in anticipatory silence, with Krishna occasionally flickering the rope that tied him, thereby adding comic relief to their plight. Shh! The Rajvasis were forest dwellers, and as such, they were especially fond of trees and have revered the Arjuna trees as something special. Seeing them now uprooted, laying flat like giants fallen from the sky, they felt sorry. These trees were like a temple for us, the outer forms of some truly magnanimous souls. But those magnanimous souls had left for heaven, and all that remained were the silent remnants of their fate. Quickly, the Rajvasi's lament for the trees was overshadowed by their concern for Krishna, whom they could not see anywhere. Some boys' parents also voiced concerns for their sons. Where's my Subala, Krishna's life and soul? And where is Vijay, Krishna's bodyguard? One of the court bards sought to quell the parents' anxiety by glorifying Krishna. O best of the gopas and gopis, just see how Mother Earth offers respects to Krishna Kumar with the arms of these trees. Their broken trunks look like the gape and mouth of the lower planets and their branches like the dancing hoods of Lord Ananta. And the trees themselves are like the slain bodies of Madhu and Kaitaba demons. Mention of the word demon was bad poetry, and it did not go down well with the Rajvasis, now abreast of the trees. Again they stopped to see what could be the cause of this calamity. They found none. Neither could they see Krishna nor his friends. Tension increased. Some soldiers looked for signs of extraordinary footprints. Aside from the many small footprints and what appeared to be handprints and marks of lower legs, there were none. The culprit did not arrive by foot. When the soldiers reported to Nanamarj, the king scoured the nearby trees, then the sky. Aside from a mixed huddle of birds that include parrots and an owl on a branch nearby, there was nothing. Since the demigods hiding behind the clouds had invoked their power of invisibility, the mystery of the fallen trees only grew. No suspicious creatures nearby, he sighed. One soldier, who had noticed and followed the dragging marks made by the mortar, said, There is a mortar on the other side of the trees. The Brajvasis looked to where Krishna had last rolled the mortar. It was barely visible under one tree, yet still effulgent, like the hidden moon during the daytime. Yet being so far from the tree trunks, there was no indication that it had been the cause of this mishap. One of the women who had seen Krishna being bound whispered, That is the mortar to which the queen had tied her son. The Rajvasis took heart. The boys could hear the adults talking, and they whispered, They have seen the mortar. We are undone. What should we do now? But Krishna was not ready to be exposed. Don't worry, 
We're not in danger. Just stay down. Expanding his illusory potency, Krishna induced the Rajmasis to forget the murder and to again speculate on the cause of the Arjuna's fall. Under the influence of divine will, the Rajmasis again question each other. How could these big trees fall? There was no storm, no rain, no wind. There are no elephant tracks to indicate a herd had knocked them down. Completely uprooted, these glorious trees are now dry and dead, like clouds without water. Was it some demons or akshashas? Or maybe demigods? Whoever it was, they caused a disaster. And if it was some tribals gathering firewood, where are they now? Although the Rajmasis had earlier hit on the clue to the fallen trees, the mortar, because of divine bewilderment, they failed to follow up on their lead. In their continued state of confusion, the Rajmasis' anxiety for Krishna's safety increased, and with it, their feelings of love and desire to be united with him. At that time, Yashoda Devi and her attendants arrive. The villagers made way for their queen, who hurried to her husband's side and frantically asked, Where is my son? Where is Krishna? Madhya Yashoda's loving ecstasy added to the love of the Rajvasis, and the combined emotion outweighed the influence of Krishna's maya. As the balance tipped in the Rajvasis' favor, Krishna realized that he would not be able to hide any longer. Where is my blue lotus? What happened to him? Taking in the scene with frantic eyes, Yashoda became frenzied, and the Rajvasis huddled around to calm her. It is said that the force of devotees' pure ecstasy can reach such heights as to neutralize Krishna's divinity. And with his mother present, Krishna was unable to remain hidden from the Rajvasis. His game was up. While the Rajvasis were momentarily occupied with the queen, Krishna concluded that it was best to be proactive and to reveal himself. He whispered to his friends, Look, their backs are turned on us. Let us surprise them before they discover us. Without waiting for his friends, Krishna suddenly rose to his leafy cover, calm, fearless, and innocent. Seeing him, his friends too stood up and began to move about, albeit, uncertainly. Appearing unassumingly busy, Krishna began to play, pulling on the motor and flicking the rope, while his hesitant friends stood by and watched. Naturally, the Rajvasis took notice of the Gopas and called out, Look! There is Krishna! There are our boys! Others turned to see Krishna, free of danger, smiling, a priceless jewel ornamenting Mother Earth, absorbed, as always, in joys of play. Elated, they all looked at each other, exclaiming, What happened? What happened? 